Yes, he will. Amen. Thank you both so, so much. Well, good morning again, once again. Uh, it is good to be with you today. Just wanted to take a few minutes and, uh, and just tell you how excited Lisa and I are to, uh, to be your pastor and uh, to be your senior. I've heard it called all kind of different things, senior pastor, pastor. Uh, head flunky, um, you know, all, all kinds of different stuff that's come, come across my desk, but, uh, but we'll take them all. We're just excited about it. We know that, uh, that God has a plan for Cornerstone, and we're excited to be just a little bit of a part of it. Uh, just know this, um, I'm going to pour myself into you. I'm going to pour myself into uh, each age group, uh, from the youngest to the oldest, and uh, we're going to see what God has for us and do the things that he wants us to do in the future. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to do all the things that I feel like God wants me to do as your pastor. So we are grateful for this opportunity. So thank you. And uh, we're excited about that. Uh, as a pastor, a uh, couple of things you should know. Um, I feel like that I should live to a higher standard. I should be a cut above. Should be a little more than the average Christian. I should set the example. I should take my responsibility extremely seriously, and I do. And I'm looking again forward to what it is that God has for us here. Now, I'd like to read you something that tells you a little bit about what my take on a pastor is. So listen, it says, my calling is sure. My challenge is big. My vision is clear, my desire is strong, my influence is eternal, my impact is critical, my values are solid, my faith is tough, my mission is urgent, and my purpose is unmistakable. My direction is forward. My heart is genuine. My strength is supernatural. My reward is promised and my God is real. I refuse to be dismayed, disengaged, disgruntled, discouraged, or distracted. Neither will I look back, stand back, fall back, go back, or sit back. I do not need applause, flattery, adulation, prestige, stature, or veneration. I have no time for business as usual, mediocre standards, small thinking, normal expectations, average results, ordinary ideas, petty disputes, or low vision. I will not give up, will not give in, will not bail out, lie down, turn over, quit, or surrender. I am a pastor. This is what I do. So that's who you have in me. That's who you have called. So if you expect anything more or less, this is the creed that I live by. I live by this, and I live by what God's Word says. This book right here tells me everything I need to know about being a pastor. And when I get away from this manual is when we all fail. So this manual will be who we go by. This is what we teach from. This is what we look to when we need answers. This is the Bible. And God has instructed me to use it. So I will do that. Please follow as we do. God wants us to use Cornerstone in a mighty way. He's put us, now listen, he's put us all here at the same time for a purpose. There's a reason that we're all here as a group together. He, he wants us to, to study together. He wants us to fellowship together. And he wants us to commune together. But more importantly than all of that, he wants us to worship him together. He wants us to serve him together. He wants us to be a body of one worshiping an audience of one. That's who he's called us to be. That's what he wants from me. That's what he wants from you. This is what we must do as a church. Our number one priority must be worshiping him. If we get this right, everything else will fall into place. Everything will. Our God is an amazing God. He can do amazing things. Let me hear you say, God can do amazing things. God can do amazing things. He never fails. He never stops. He never sleeps. He's always in our presence. He will not fail so long as we follow him. We will not fail. We must be unified of the body of Christ. We must glorify him in all that we say and do. We must be available to do it when he calls us to do it. And we must have 2020 vision in 2020 and beyond. 
So let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you again for this day, this opportunity to be back in your pulpit. Thank you for this opportunity that I have to pastor this church. You've called me to shepherd here. So, Father, I ask you right now in front of all these witnesses to just please guide me, direct me. Give me the vision that you have for this church. Help us to see it together. Help us to follow you, Father, as only we can do and only you can do. So, Lord, we give this to you. We give this term, however long it is. Father, we, we don't know that but we know that you're in control so we just pray father that you use it while we have it and father we just ask father that you bless us in a mighty way and it's through jesus we pray amen this morning we're going to look at, at several scriptures um, our base text is going to come from the book of proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 so let's turn there together go ahead and turn there when you get it say i got it proverbs 29 18 everybody got it well, I want to do something different this morning. Let's stand together. Let's honor the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read this verse through several different versions of the Bible. So just hang with me here just a minute. This comes from the New International Version. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instructions. And again, I've looked at several respected versions of this verse. So let's continue. The New King James says it this way. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. The HCSB or the Holman says it this way. Without revelation, people run wild, but one who listens to instruction will be happy. The New American Standard says this, and it uses a different word. We've been saying the word revelation. Listen to what it says. It says, where there is no what? Vision. The people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. And then finally, the King James Version, the one that's been around the longest period of time, says it this way. Where there is no vision, the people do what? They perish, but he who keepeth the law, happy is he. Thank you. You may be seated. Helen Keller once answered a question. Y'all know who Helen Keller is? She was asked a question, what would be worse than being born blind? Her reply, having sight without vision. So, what is vision? Vision is the ability to see beyond the surface of our human potential. It's not what we are, but what we desire to become or where we desire to go. Vision is a picture that can be seen of what is not yet, but what, if, what it can be. Our present belief is reflective of whatever our vision is. Where we are in life is directly connected to our vision or the lack thereof. What you are today is a direct result of what your vision was yesterday. Let's look at another scripture. Turn with me over to the book of Hebrews. Let's look at chapter 11, verses 1 and 3. Hebrews 11, and we were here just a, a few months ago. We did a sermon series on faith, and, and we, we studied some of this chapter. If you remember that, we talked about uh, Abraham. We talked about several of those heroes of the faith that were in there. So we're going back to that for just a minute. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 3 reads this way. Now, faith is, is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. That tells me this. You see, God had a vision. Listen, God had a vision when he created the heavens and the earth. There was a plan in place. He knew exactly what his vision was. He knew what he wanted it to look like. He knew what he wanted it to say. He knew what he wanted involved. He had a vision. He had a plan. Every blade of grass, every drop of water in the ocean, every piece of vegetation, the sun, the moon, the stars, every animal from the tiniest insect, I've often wondered why he created the gnat <laughs> or the mosquito those are the most aggravating insects but he created those I think about that every time I pop one 
but he created it. But he created this with purpose. Even Adam, Adam, Eve, all creator things were created with purpose and intense vision. This was not by accident. God's vision, listen, was to populate the earth and to make a way to provide for his creation. He spoke it into existence and through his vision it still exists today. God also had a vision for the fall of man. This didn't take God by surprise. He knew what was going to happen at the tree this day. He knew exactly where Adam and Eve were coming from. He was well aware of this part of his vision. Through the sinfulness and disobedience of Eve and Adam eating from this forbidden tree, God's vision was to send Jesus. His vision was to send Jesus, his only son, to die for us on a cross and save us from our own sin. God also had a vision when Jesus ascended back into heaven and then the Holy Spirit came. Remember the book of Acts? We'll talk about that some. The book of Acts chapter 2 verses 33 to 35 tells us that the Holy Spirit lives in the heart of every person who believes and is therefore as close and as available as your next breath. That's how close the Holy Spirit is to you. God's vision here was to complete the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so that we can feel the presence of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. That was the purpose behind that vision. Someone once said this, vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. And it is. The right vision in our lives, it gives us a few things. Let's listen to this. First of all, and you can write, and take notes, write this down. Vision gives us stability. If we want to stay on track through every circumstance, then we must have vision. People who struggle with vision tend to, to just fall backwards. They get discouraged. Having a good, solid, God-given vision is the most stable way that you can live your daily life. You know, it's sad, but there are some that live in this world, even today, that go through their entire life from birth to death, the dash. You know what I'm talking about? You ever see it on the tombstones? The dash, you have your, your, your birth date and then you have your date of your death. There's a dash in there. That dash describes your entire life. That's what that dash is for. But they use their dash, they go through that whole time period and they never realize the vision that God has for them. Now why is that? Why could that possibly be? Don't we want to know what God's vision is for our life? Don't we want to know what it is that God has for us? We want the best that we can have in our lives all the time, but we don't see the vision. I would answer that by saying they got no desire to seek God's vision. It's right in front of them. If they were looking for it, they would certainly see it. Christians who do not seek God's vision must be some of the most miserable people in the world. It just takes my breath. They have no spiritual stability. They would rather spend, listen, they would rather spend their time looking for fault in others than seeking God's vision for their lives. That's sad. We can have stability in our lives by seeking and realizing God's vision for us. Not only does God's vision give us stability, it also gives us guidance. If we have no vision for what God wants to do in our lives, then we won't bother to push through to, to get the full story from the Holy Spirit. We just won't bother to do that if we don't have vision. You see, by seeking Him, we get His guidance. You know, and for me, there's no greater feeling of accomplishment than knowing that, we have something, that, we, that we've done something to please God. Isn't that just a great Feeling, knowing that you have done something that pleases God, it is for me. His guiding hand on our lives, it never stops leading us. By having His vision for ourselves, He guides us, He molds us, He shapes us into what He wants us to be. Every word we say, every step we take, every thought we think, every breath we breathe can be guided by the Lord if we will just seek His vision. Everybody say vision. Not only does vision give us stability and guidance, vision also gives us great joy and great excitement. For me, I feel that, that God has given me a strong vision for evangelism. I think by now you've detected this from me. If you haven't, you haven't been listening. 
Because God has, has impacted me with this. And he said, Steve, we got to get beyond the four walls. we got to get out in our community, in our neighborhood, in our state. Wherever it is I send you, Steve, you got to go because I'm counting on you. I told you in the scriptures, I told you in Matthew to go therefore. I'm counting on you to do that. That's what he's commanded me to do. That's what he's commanded you to do. There's nothing that brings me more joy than when a new soul comes to know Jesus Christ. As I told you earlier today, I'm a pastor. This is what I do. It's important to me to see my labor become fruit. That's the way we should all feel. We should celebrate with the angels in heaven when someone comes to know Jesus. And then we should realize quickly that there's more work to be done. There are lost people in our midst. We can't afford to let up, can't afford to give up, can't afford to shut up. What a joy it is to see people coming to know Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. When we get that, we'll be on our way. You see, God had a vision... A God-given vision will, will bring glory to God and it will fit us into His eternal purpose. Listen, a true vision from God is not self-seeking. It's not about us. Not at all. Our vision should never be about who we are, never be about what we want. It should always be about who He is and what He wants through us and for us. A true vision God, a true vision from God never praises us. It praises Him. It glorifies Jesus Christ. Any other vision is not from God, period. If it's not God's vision, it's your vision. And you without God will certainly fail. I'm concerned because talking about worldwide, some of us are not concerned in the least about vision. We're perfectly content with the way things are. Listen, as long as we're content with the status quo, we will never discover God's vision. As long as we're happy with the status quo, God will not speak. If we're more concerned with rocking the boat than we are storming the gates of hell, we will never discover God's plan for the church. Amen. 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 Well, Pastor Steve, how do I get this vision that you're speaking of? You know, sometimes God gives us his vision when we're desperate. He speaks to us when our whole heart, our whole mind and soul is set on Him. When we're hungry and thirsty for God is when we find Him. Matthew 5, 6 says this. And this is one of the Beatitudes. I love the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Be filled. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3 says this. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation or vision awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. What we should pull from this verse is the fact that sometimes we have to wait on God's vision. Sometimes we have to wait on him to move. Sometimes we have to wait on him to see it. But here's what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't move forward in our own time and in our own strength with our own plans. That's what the enemy does. Church, as much as we need to seek God's perfect vision, we've also got to look out for what I call vision killers. There are vision killers among us. So what are they? What are these vision killers that you speak of, Pastor? First is complacency. I'm going to give you some C's today. First is complacency. Complacency in what? Complacency in our attendance. Complacency in our giving. We must see our part in division. We're all important. If you call yourself Christian, then you have a part in the vision. You matter. But only if it's God's vision through you. We must not get complacent with anything at our church. Listen, there's work to be done. It takes everyone carrying their part of the vision. We don't have the luxury of standing around not seeking our vision. We don't have the luxury of coming to church just because it's Sunday morning and well, that's just what I do. We don't have the luxury to hold out on God. We must give Him our best and we must give Him our first fruits and we must seek the vision that He has for us. Complacency. 
The second vision killer can be carnality. We allow ourselves to be sidetracked from our vision by our own flesh. Anybody ever told you, sometimes you just get in your own way? You ever heard that? Our way and our vision is easier than God's because I don't have to take the time to pray and wait on the Lord. I can just do what I want right now, settle it. This is a huge vision killer. Huge vision killer. Because we make it about who? We make it about us. It has nothing to do with God. We have to trust His. We cannot be carnal about this. We have to make sure that we are looking, staying out of our own flesh, looking for what it is that He has for us, making sure that we stay on track with Him. I've seen this time and time again. Another word is impatience. You ever get impatient? We think we all have the answers when in reality we don't know nothing. We know very little about it. We must acknowledge God for who He is and trust that He will give us His vision when He sees fit. The third vision killer is our critics. Anybody have any critics? We must beware of an evil report, shouldn't we? We have to look out for what people are saying about us. There are people that are waiting for you. You call yourself Christian. There are people waiting for you to mess up. They want you to make mistakes so they can say, yeah, I told you so. I knew who he really was. They wait for those opportunities. They know exactly that you will eventually make a mistake, but they insist on failure. These guys are critics. This type of thinking doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. He is distorting some of their thought processes. He's causing them to try and distract us from God's perfect vision. Listen, folks, these people are dangerous. These people are extremely dangerous. Satan is dangerous. He is real. He's out to seek. He's out to kill. He's out to destroy. He doesn't want us to find God's vision for our lives because it threatens the very grip that he has on our world. He uses people around you to talk into dark corners about others. He uses people around you to diminish what your church is doing. He uses people around you to cause confusion in God's church. The reason he's using them is because they're not seeking God's vision. If they were busy seeking God's vision, they wouldn't have time to stand around listening to the garbage. Instead, they would stand around praying with each other, seeking unity in God's vision for their lives in the church. Oh, how I want to see that happen happen not only here at Cornerstone but the church as a whole what revival could break out if we would only seek God's vision for our lives today we can give ourselves totally to the fulfilling of God's vision and, and I'm gonna close six things let me give you six things quickly first is commitment we must be committed to the cause of Jesus Christ and His church. I'm talking about really committed. Really committed. Not just a, a flash in the pan commitment. Not just a, a commitment when I feel like it. But a true commitment to seeking God's vision and not our own. Secondly is compassion. Jesus always ministered with compassion. We must realize that we live in a world with flawed people. We have to minister to them with compassion or we could lose our chance with them. We have to be careful how we minister. We have to be compassionate. Third, we must be contributors. You are a contributor to this ministry. I'm not only talking about tithing and, and giving and offering, which, which are two different things, by the way. I'm talking also about contributing to the kingdom of God by realizing your own vision and sharing your part with everybody else. Fourth, we must have commonality. One voice, one sound, one purpose. Bringing God to Aiken, South Carolina and taking Aiken, South Carolina to God. We can't do that if there's disunity. We can't do that if we go off on our own without seeking what it is that God has for us. We can do that if we all realize our own vision that God has for us and we share it together in common with a, our peace of the world. 
Fifth, we must have courage. It takes courage to realize and share God's vision. We must stand up and, and be strong and courageous. Listen, being good enough is not good enough. We have to step ahead. We have to be better than good. We have to have the courage to share Jesus Christ and God's vision through us. And lastly, we must be communicators. We must communicate with the church and the world. Again, one voice, one sound, one purpose. We must be unified whether we like it or not to serve our living God consistently. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 to 27 says it this way. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right. Do not turn to the left. Keep your foot from evil. My prayer for you today is that you've already realized what God's vision is for your life and you're using it or you haven't realized God's vision for your life that you're, but you're diligently seeking it. God has a vision for you. He wants to use you. He has a vision and a plan that is tailor-made just for you. So this morning as we go to invitation time, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. If you received your vision from God, do you know what it is? Do you know where you are in this endeavor? If not, you can find it. But you have to seek it. So here's the second question. Have you been seeking God's vision in your life? Have you been looking for what it is that He has for you? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are seeking and serving the Lord in the way that He wants you to? Are you sure? Are you sure that what you're doing, what you're, you're called to do in the church? Are you sure you're doing what you're called to do outside of the church? Are you sure you are following what it is that God has for you? Do you know your personal vision? You see, when we realize all of our personal visions, we bring them into the church, that's when we find God's vision for the church. That's when we can blow the seams off of this place. Not us, but God. And God can move in a way that Aiken, South Carolina has never seen before. And He can do it here. It's because we know the vision that He has for us. And we are diligently walking towards it. We're not running from it. We're walking towards it. We're running to it. We're trying to see what it is that He has for us. When we find it, you will know it. So thirdly today, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you have no clue what it is that I'm talking about. Vision is something that you go to the eye doctor for. But if you know Jesus Christ this morning, you know that there is a bigger vision that's in line just for you. But if you don't know him today, I would invite you to come and talk with me this morning. We're going to sing a hymn in just a minute, give you a chance to respond. And I want you to do that. I want you to come today. This altar is always open. You can come and kneel and pray. If you'd like to seek your vision this morning, come and pray. We're going to be talking about this for a couple of weeks. So make sure that you are looking for your vision. Let's stand together as we sing.